Sevgili izleyenler, herkese merhaba. Ben Yapı Kredi Müzesi Müdürü Nihat Tekdemir. Müzemizde açılan Bir Zamanlar Toroslar'da Sagalasos sergisi kapsamında Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanat Loja'da düzenlediğimiz arkeoloji konferanslarına internet üzerinden devam ediyoruz. Bugünkü konumuz Sagalasos'ta açığa çıkarılan bir kaya tapınağı. Konuğumuz ise Süleyman Demirel Üniversitesi öğretim görevlisi Doktor Peter Terloen. Peter Terloen aynı zamanda Sagalasos Arkeolojik Araştırma Projesi'nin de ekip üyesi. 1998 yılında dahil olduğu proje ekibinde antik kentin Sagalasos'un farklı noktalarında araştırmalar yürüten bir akademisyen, bir araştırmacı. Ki Sagalasos Arkeolojik Araştırma Projesi'nin Burdur ve Isparta illerini de kapsayan yaklaşık 1200 kilometre karelik bir araştırma alanı var. Peter Tellon'un yürüttüğü önemli araştırmalardan, çalışmalardan bir tanesi de Sagalasos Antik Kenti'nin hemen eteklerinde yer alan ve Sagalasos'un engebeli topografyasında kendini çok da fazla belli etmeyen bir kaya tapınağının araştırılmasıydı. 2014 yılında başladığı araştırmasına, çalışmasına 2018 yılına kadar devam etti. Ve e, tapınak içerisinden e, çok sayıda pişmiş toprak figürün, e, pişmiş toprak kap parçaları ve çeşitli objeler açığa çıkardı. E, bugün e, Peter Terloen bizlere e, yürütmüş olduğu bu çalışmaların sonuçlarını e, paylaşacak. E, ben kendisine çok teşekkür ediyorum çünkü e, 4 yıllık çalışmasını bugün bizlerle burada paylaşacak. E, sizlere de katıldığınız ve dinlediğiniz için ayrıca teşekkür ediyorum. E, söz ve mikrofon Doktor Peter Terloen'de iyi seyirler dilerim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nihat Bey. Um, in today's lecture, I will present some of the results um, of a rescue excavation I conducted in the periphery of Sagalassos at a cult site known as the Rock Sanctuary. Uh, several of the objects that were found there uh, are currently on display in the Yapukredi exhibition. In the landscape of the ancient Mediterranean, natural formations such as caves and other types of cavities were often thought of as the materialization of numerous powers. As places that embodied the powers inherent in nature, people were drawn to them and established sanctuaries there. Although the, the term sanctuary suggests an architecturally defined space with features such as altars and temples, much of ancient religious activity, especially in the countryside, was connected with specific places in the landscape which inspired Ulm, with or without any man-made signs of their importance. Even at a time when monumental architecture had assumed a vital role in classical antiquity, the cultic significance of these natural features endured as they became part of sacred landscapes. Of course, there were no sacred places per se, but only spaces institutionalized and or recognized by humans who perceived them as having a sacred character, either because of some special topographical or luminous quality, or because they contained some particular manifestation of the divine. The description of sacred places, therefore, cannot be separated from the persons that considered them sacred. It was their ritual activity that marked the place as sacred, and it is the material residue of this religious behavior that allows the natural site to be archaeologically identified as a cultic one. Natural locations were transformed by man into cultural constructs and invested with social meaning and significance. In this respect, caves were no different from any man-built monument. The site that will be discussed today, the so-called Rock Sanctuary or RS, is situated in the southeastern periphery of the city of Sagalassos in the ancient region of Pisidia, uh, located in southwest Turkey, as you know. The Rock Sanctuary was located some 600 meters to the east of the urban center in the liminal space between the untamed wild of the Taurus Mountains and the civilized life of the city as a nexus of nature and society. At the evening. It consists of a distinctive limestone rock outcropping the mountain slope with large crevices covered by limestone boulders, thus creating several cavities within the mass of the rock. Our S2 became a cultural construct invested with religious meaning, as is clear from the abundant votive offerings that were found there, indicating that this natural feature was considered to be a bearer of luminous powers by the people who visited it. Dumps of excavated material present throughout the site testified to many years of illegal digging, which destroyed much of the stratigraphical record, undoubtedly caused the loss of numerous finds, many of which ended up in private collections and foreign museums through auction houses and art galleries. 
Given the fact that the site is easily accessible for clandestine activities, as attested by the uh, illegal excavations that I just mentioned, permission was sought for scientific uh, investigation of the sanctuary in the form of rescue excavations in collaboration with the Directorate of the Archaeological Museum of Porto. Rescue excavations were carried out at the site between 2014 and 2018. They yielded evidence for the deposition of specialized offerings in the form of ceramic, glass, metal and stone vessels, pieces of personal adornment, instruments of, uh, for textile production, but especially many thousands of fragments of terracotta figurines, all of which identified RS as a special purpose site, an area that was set apart for the worship of gods. It was a holy place where people went to undertake religious rituals in the form of sacrifice, prayer and the giving of votive offerings. Judging by the pottery that was found there, this cult site was in use from the first half of the second century BC until the first half of the third century AD. Although the work at RS has not yet been completed and the processing of its numerous finds is still ongoing, some preliminary conclusions on the nature of the sanctuary can already be made. The aim of today's presentation is to assess what the significance of this natural monument was in the sacred landscape of Sagalassos and what it can tell us about the community that conceived it and used it as a cult site. We intend to answer these questions through a discussion of the situation and physical form of the sanctuary on the one hand and the residue of uh, human activity in the shapes of different classes of material evidence embedded in it on the other. Topographical location and form of the cult site are critical for the establishment of social identities, as the natural topography is invested with meaning. During its use, RS was a place as a cultural significant locale that existed within a landscape and was meaningful to specific cultural groups through everyday experience. Yet in order to understand the significance of the cave site, we need to look not only at its location and form, but also at the ar artifacts that, that were deposited there. As the remains of religious practices, the latter are of crucial importance for understanding the function of the locale. The presence of specific artifact categories, the relevance between various artifacts, their specific context and the manner of their deposition, all manifest social action and provide the particular character of the cult site. Since elements of material culture are held to reflect cultural values and religious beliefs, the materiality of ritual will be used here as basis for reconstructing rituals, establishing the concerns that they addressed, and ultimately identifying the people involved. In the minds of ancient peoples, the land was full of gods, and any special feature of the landscape could be associated with a divinity. The distinctive topographical feature at the heart of RS is a cave-like space consisting of large crevices in the rock outcrop, which are covered by huge blocks of limestone, somewhat similar to the situation of the better known sanctuary of Kapokaya in the territory of Pergamon. Given that in classical times the same words were used for real caves and their man-made uh, imitations, such as Antron, Svelion or Stonehill, it is clear that people put emphasis on the function and symbolism of cavities rather than on their technological and visual aspects. The covered crevices of Eris will therefore most probably have been as much a cave in the minds of the people visiting it as a real cavern. On the outside, no obvious remains of any man-made structures or traces of stone carving could be observed. And also inside the natural appearance of the outcrop was largely left unchanged. Our current understanding of Eris is severely hindered by the collapse of the ceiling of the complex, making large parts inaccessible and the spatial analysis of the complex a rather difficult enterprise. So far, four main areas could be distinguished inside the rock art group, designated rooms one to four, three of which we will have a closer look at. Room one is a covered corridor-like space in the southern part of the, of the art group. This roughly rectangular room with a southeast northwest orientation was accessible from the southeast. Near the entrance, its walls appear to have been partly carved out of the uh, limestone bedrock to facilitate access. At the northern end of the space, an extension was present on both the east and the west side. The latter one gave access to further spaces which have now been blocked by the collapsed ceiling of limestone blocks. This fact, together with the absence of any deposits other than a succession of floor levels, suggests that it most probably served as a corridor leading to the original center of the sanctuary, 
the so-called cult room or naos, where the cult image or images would may have been located and where the rituals of communications with the gods would have taken place. This cult room can probably be identified with room four, a natural cavity with a trapezoidal plan situated in the central part of the complex between room one and room two. This room was originally located at the western end of the corridor, but the collapse of the ceiling eventually separated those spaces and made the alleged cult room largely inaccessible for research. Whatever its exact shape, it is clear from the presence of several used oil lamps among the votive offerings that this central space will have been a dark and cave-like, and therefore numinous in the minds of the ancient population, a place where man could communicate with the divine world through religious ritual. The area situated in the northern part of the outcrop consists of a series of interconnecting natural cavities. This room too did not display any signs of stone carving, nor was it accessible through any purpose-made entrance. A simple gap between the covering boulders appears to have served that purpose. It was probably the result of natural karstic processes, which created a roughly triangular space with an apex oriented to the southeast. Additional spaces were present on the east and west side the ceiling of which had again partly collapsed. These spaces were the origin of much of the illegally excavated material found immediately outside of the crevice, outside of the, crevice to the north. Disturbed topography of this part of the site severely hinders representation of the space and the retrieved finds. Nevertheless, sufficient in-situ deposits containing fragmented incomplete artifacts have been retrieved to identify the cavities as a dump for the cleanup of ritual activities that took place at the sanctuary, rather than a primary location of votive depositions, such as a botrus. This assemblage of votive goods could be generally dated to the first and second centuries AD, based on the associated pottery. Yet several elements indicated that it had not been deposited there originally. The generally fragmented nature of the material with, not, uh, one, with none of the pottery or figurines, for example, being complete or broken in situ. Moreover, there is the weathered nature of the material, which suggests that it had been exposed to the elements for a considerable period of time prior to being buried. And finally, the presence of several fragments of terracotta roof tiles and water pipes, which clearly must have belonged to structures outside of the crypts. Consequently, it was most probably the result of a cleanup operation within the sanctuary. Few shirts of 4th century AD pottery present within the deposit provide a terminus postquam for this disposal. So a sanctuary after the sanctuary went uh, out of use. Except for the minor interventions near the entrance in the southeast part of the outcrop, none of the, spaces, of the spaces mentioned here display any signs of an attempt to modify and shape them architecturally. An altar may have been present inside the central part of the outcrop, but a natural feature may have been used instead. Also outside of the cavities, there are no signs of any significant art architectural modification, although the substantial amount of roof fragments recovered from the site does suggest that one or more places within or around the sanctuary were roofed since the late Taoistic period. These were perhaps small picnic spots where the ritual dining took place. Since all sacrifices generally had to be consumed within the sanctuary, the presence of appropriate cooking facilities and a suitable eating place is to be expected. Yet the absence of other durable building materials, such as stone blocks or bricks, suggests that they were only semi-permanent structures in mainly perishable materials. Also, the fragments of large storage vessels or pithoi point to installations being present in or around the sanctuary, as these huge vessels were unlikely brought by people visiting the sanctuary. Possibly, they contained water for use during actions in the sanctuary or otherwise could have supplied visitors with drinking water. Several pieces of ter terracotta water pipes equally suggest the presence of a water installation of some, ki of some kind. As purification by water upon entering the sanctuary was a standard ritual necessity, as it still is today, the existence of such a structure would not be surprising. The general appearance of the site, however, is that of an unaltered feature of the natural landscape, which identifies it as a natural sanctuary, being not a monument constructed by human labor, but a non-monumentalized cult site with a natural feature, in caso a cave-like crevice, as primary recipient of worship. 
there are no traces of monumentalization, nor any representational content like statuary or rock or leaves, or epigraphic content like public or private inscriptions. Not even any obvious modifications to meet the requirements of worship, like rock cut steps, benches, or votive niches. The natural place was turned into a cultural place simply through the deposition of artifacts. In order to understand its meaning and importance, a cult site should not studied in, be studied in isolation, but seen as part of the local sacred landscape. When compared with other constituent elements of the sacred landscape of Sagalassos, being the monumental sanctuaries of the city, centers such as the Doric Temple above the Upper Agora and the Tichaion on the Upper Agora, the Temple of Apollo Clarius above the Lower Agora and the Temple of Antoninus Pius along the colonnaded street, the different nature of Ares in terms of location and architectural form is obvious. These major urban sanctuaries were magnets for public ceremony and display and enjoyed official interest for many generations. While these temples and shrines housed celebrated cult images, were depicted on civic coinage, dominated the urban center and stood witness to the communal effort, no such elements of public display can be discerned at Ares. From the early Roman imperial period onwards, temple architecture also appears at cult sites in the Pisidian countryside, including that of Sagalassos, often resulting in the monumentalization of natural sanctuaries, as is illustrated by the examples of Arpalektepe near Serge, Elexitepe near Malos, Inarasse near Keraya, and Zindan Maharese near Timbiada. This can be seen as part of the political appropriation of partic particular local practices by the ruling elite, which introduced monumentality and public spectacles to these already significant sites of cultural practice. Yet such monumentalization did not occur at Ares. In spite of its longevity and popularity, no grandiose interventions of the political elite can be ascertained there. Although the civic community was undoubtedly knowledgeable about its natural environment and thus aware of the existence of the rock outcrop and its cavities, something that is corroborated by the fact that it already came into existence shortly after Sagosos became a city, at no point during its more than 400 year long life was there any attempt to monumentalize the site. Even when the site experienced the boom in popularity during the Ro early Roman imperial period, as evidenced by the number and quality of the votive offerings left there, this did not translate into a modification of the natural setting. All this indicates that there was a deliberate choice not to invest in it architecturally. This meant that it did not come to dominate the sacred landscape and assume a more powerful role in the life of the civic community like other natural sanctuaries in the region. In turn, this hints at the status of the sanctuary. The absence of signs of official involvement, not only in monumental architecture, but also civic priesthood and uh, monumental writing are absent. But this would uh, situate the sanctuary outside of the sphere of public religion. RS was obviously a cult site that was established by ordinary people and remained the focus of popular cult throughout its existence. Besides the form, also the location of the cult site should be taken into consideration when evaluating its status. In this respect, the element of marginality seems to have played an important role. Although RS is situated only 600 meters away from Sagalassos in the transitional area between city and countryside, it does not lie along one of the ancient routes leading to the city that could have been used for processions linking the cult site to the sector, for example. Moreover, there is no visual connection between the urban center and the site, which remained invisible for, from most of the city area, hidden behind the promontory that bore the Sagalassus to the east. As has been demonstrated by numerous studies, such visual connectivity was important for rural sanctuaries that wanted to maintain close ties with the urban center and or played a geopolitical role in processes of territory formation and control. RS, on the other hand, was visually cut off from the rest of the religious landscape, and the lack of monumental markers indicates that it was not part of the network of public sanctuaries and played no obvious role in stating any territorial claims either. Indeed, the isolated location of the sanctuary may even suggest a need for distance, distance from the polis, from the ancient city, and its official religion. Sacred space is not only defined through form and location, the rituals carried out there also are crucial for the mental and spatial comprehension of the sacred space. In spite of the lack of monumental markers, 
RS retains its sacred function over several centuries, and knowledge of the place was handed over from generation to generation, although commemoration generally occurs through the construction of monuments. Another way of creating memories is through ritual acts. For such an event to be remembered, it had to be an active process conducted between successive generations of people if it were to have any importance, as there were no obvious, vis no obvious visible reminders. For the case of RS, this continuance is brought out by the uninterrupted deposition of objects between the early 2nd century BC and the early 3rd century AD. Such persistent hints at the shared body of knowledge that was part of local identities. In spite of the spoiled nature of most of the examined context, the observed consistency of the material assemblages throughout disturbed and undisturbed context was remarkable. This demonstrates that the deposits from RS are still representative for the original composition of the votive assemblages and therefore valuable for archaeological research. Judging by those material assemblages retrieved from the site, there were two main types of ritual activity taking place there. The first being uh, ritual dining and then the second votive deposition, and we will have a closer look at both of them now. Both the dump of the uh, illicit excavations as the in situ deposits contained finds, namely pottery and formal remains, that could be identified as the debris of meals which were held at the sanctuary throughout its lifespan. What pottery did people bring with them when they visited the cult site? In terms of function, since the majority of fragments concerned closed and open forms of locally produced tableware, we can envisage a place where they came to celebrate specific occasions and for that purpose brought food and beverages to do so. The, clear quanti the fair quantity of closed vessels, as well as the limited number of actual cooking vessels, suggest that people presumably brought their meals and beverages with them to this place rather than preparing them on site. The relatively low number of faunal remains related to consumption, which stands in contrast to the large amounts of what related to dining, also suggests the preparations of meals outside of the sacred precinct. From this, we can conclude uh, we can also conclude that animal sacrifice will not have been a very common or important ritual at RS because the meat of such animal sacrifices generally had to be consumed within the sanctuary, which in turn would have yielded a far greater amount of animal bones than actually retrieved during the excavations. The excavated fauna remains related to consumption mainly consisted of chicken, the, cheap, the cheapest sacrificial animal, but also the one favored by certain gods such as Aphrodite and Asclepius. Sheep and goat were also represented uh, among those former remains. The overall repertoire of the pottery, as well as its quality in comparison to other contemporary excavated contexts from the urban center, basically suggests nothing out of the ordinary. In other words, what people brought along presumably came from their own households, from their own kitchens. This could explain the observed limited functional variety on the one hand and the rather broad morphological range on the other. No large sets of dining accoutrements have been retrieved at RS as they have been found, for example, at the so-called Grottenheiligtum at Bergamo. Together with the lack of other indications for uh, some form of communal organization, such as the arrangement of sizable dining spaces, this suggests that the meals held at the cult site appear to have involved smaller groups of people bringing their own crockery, not the celebration of communal festivals. Such ritual meals were typical occasions at which the common identity of the group was reaffirmed. So we could possibly envisage family groups who came to the sanctuary to ritually celebrate an important social event in their private lives and enjoy the meal together in small makeshift shelters outside of the cafes. In terms of material residue, a religious practice that was even more important than the consumption of meals was the ritual of votive offering especially from the early Roman imperial period onwards. Fundamental to the study of this ritual is the identification of material objects as votive offerings. Because of the many situations in which they were used and various functions they fulfilled, but also depending on the socioeconomic status of the votaries, votive objects could take on many forms. As a result of standard shapes and images, the cultic nature of certain types of evidence, like representations of deities, is fairly easy to establish. In many cases, however, ritual objects cannot be recognized as easily, as there is nothing in their intrinsic nature that distinguishes them from objects of everyday use, like oil lamps or pieces of personal adornment. 
except when present in explicitly conflict contexts, such objects often remain undetectable. The overwhelming number of terracotta figurines, literally thousands of fragments that were found at RS, constitute a clear specialization in the deposits and the deposition of objects with a known ritual function that allowed it to be identified as a special purpose site. Consequently, other material categories from the same stratigraphical context can be, can be interpreted in the same ritual light. A full overview of the finds of Ares would take us uh, too far in this presentation. It will suffice here to list some of the main categories of offerings. During the Hellenistic period, offerings other than pottery used in the ritual meals were restricted to some glass and ceramic unguentaria or perfume bottles as well as a handful of fragments of terracotta figurines that could be attributed to this period. The celebration of the event with meals was obviously more important at the time than the offering of gifts, unless the latter were of perishable nature and left no traces in the archaeological record. The deposition of votive offerings increased dramatically during the Roman imperial period. These now included purpose-made offerings such as lead and terracotta figurines, terracotta and metal plaques, miniature vessels and oil lamps in Latin terracotta, and miniature mirrors, as well as daily objects of the instrumentarium domesticum, such as bone hairpins, spindles, whirls, and dye staffs, glass vessels, glass and ceramic inventaria, pieces of jewelry, oil lamps, inkwells, gaming pieces, finger symbols, and even a few coins. Locally produced mold bed terracotta figurines constitute by far the most numerous category of votive offerings at Ares during Roman imperial times. As cheap but very specialized objects, affordable to all classes of society, terracotta figurines were a popular category of votive gifts in most regions of the ancient Mediterranean and also in Pisidia. More than 40,000 fragments, representing at least some 3,000 figurines, have been found during the rescue excavations, and they will be discussed in further detail now. In the contexts that have been studied so far, almost 40% of the identifiable terracotta figurines consist of representations of human individuals belonging to different age classes, busts of young and adult women making up to uh, some 80% of all human images, young women playing several musical instruments, nurturing mothers or kurotrophoi, but also young girls and boys depicted as students holding tabellae or writing tablets on their laps. Male figures, on the other hand, are only attested as boys, both as students and busts, and uh, some other lessons as hor on horseback, but never as adults. Although these images are generic, not realistic portraits, they should probably be seen as representations of the votaries or the individuals for whom divine protection was invoked. In the case of uh, RS, this means women, children and youths. Representations of deities were also very common making up some 59% of all terracotta figurines. Among them, figurines of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, appearing in many different guises, proved predominant through all, throughout all studied fine context, making up some 69% of all figurines of deities. She is followed in popularity by her son Eros, the small uh, winged child god, with some 11%, frequently accompanied by his girlfriend Psyche. Other female deities included in order uh, of frequency, uh, the goddess of fortune Tyche, Athena, the mother goddess Kidele, Nemesis, the goddess of divine retribution, Kihia, the goddess of health, and the Egyptian mother goddess Isis. Overall, male divine presence was rather restricted, with Hermes being the most represented god. Uh, again, some 4% uh, of the representations are his uh, figurines. Others comprised Ares, Asclepius, Harpocrates, Heracles, the moon god man, and Sarapis, all of whom were attested by only a few examples. Especially the absence of the leading civic gods of Sagalassos, Zeus and Apollo, is striking in this regard. Figurines of animals are limited overall, less than 1% of the assemblies. Most frequently attested are terracotta birds such as cocks and pigeons, the favorite animals of Aphrodite, which may have been pleasing gifts to the gods, or they substituted sacrifices of those who could not afford even a small sacrificial animal. In absence of inscribed votive offerings, the identity of the god or gods worshipped at Ares was approached through the identification and quantification of divine representations. 
Although it is not always the case that tutelary deity, that the tutelary deity of the sanctuary is represented by the largest number of figurines, the outright dominance of her representations and the corroborating evidence of animal images clearly single out Aphrodite as the main subject of worship at Arnes. This is somewhat extraordinary as there is normally a significant relationship between the physical configuration of places where the sanctuaries were established and the gods to whom they were dedicated. Although commonly associated with lush gardens with fruit trees and flowers, cave sanctuaries for Aphrodite are scarce. This suggests, together with the fact that the goddess seems to have reached the region of Pisidia only by the end of the Hellenistic period, that she was only a later addition to a sanctuary that may originally have served the cult of another god or goddess. Such cave locations were often predestined for the cult of the mother goddess Kybele, who, because of her strong ties to nature, was predominantly worshipped at naturally formed cult places. Yet, contrary to other cave sanctuaries in the region, clear evidence is lacking so far for Eres, which is partly due to the lack of excavated Hellenistic deposits. It is obvious from her limited number of terracotta figurines that by the Roman imperial period at least, Kibele only played a secondary role here and was overshadowed by Aphrodite. The broad repertoire of divine representations retrieved from Eris would suggest that the sanctuary was not exclusively the preserve of a single deity, but that several deities were worshipped there. Yet the observed multiplicity may also partly be explained by the phenomenon of visiting gods. Those are images representing one deity, which were given to another deity because of a special relationship between the two or as a pleasing gift. This phenomenon could account, for example, for the singular presence of certain deities, such as Ares, the lover of Aphrodite, for whom he would have been a, blessing, a pleasing gift. Yet it has also been understood as indicating that people dedicated no matter what they had at hand and that it didn't matter much what they gave. Such a simplistic approach to the agency of votaries, however, does not account in this case for the generally limited presence of male deities compared to that of goddesses. As already mentioned, Votive offerings took many different forms, but it would be wrong to think that no matter what could be dedicated. Votive gifts were always connected to the identity of the dedicators as they reflected in their form the particular preoccupation of those who made them. Moreover, the amalgam of goddesses represented at Ares do share certain characteristics. They are all deities concerned with female fertility, womanhood, and the nursing and upbringing of the young. Such dedications to chorotrophic divinities who nurtured the young indicate a concern for female reproductive processes and the physical development of infants. So rather than uh, the coincidence of availability, it was the concerns these gods addressed that caused their presence in this extra urban location. And this brings us now to the people worshipping them. Natural sanctuaries are normally located in the rural sphere and have therefore often been associated with simplicity or even poverty and with worshippers from the lower strata of society, something which has recently been criticized. Natural sanctuaries are now understood as expressions of religious structures and needs, not as reflections of social hierarchies. Given its close proximity to the urban center, Ares was undoubtedly frequented by the people of Sargalassos. This is also corroborated by the finds. Not only were the tableware used for ritual feasting, as well as the votive offerings in the shape of uh, figurines and plaques locally produced, but also the import of some of the new uh, types of votive gifts, including lead-glazed pottery and coins from Perge and Pomphilia, seashells from the Mediterranean, and even Lilifiori glass and alabaster stone vessels from possibly as far away as Egypt, indicate an urban rather than a rural origin for the sanctuaries created. Sanctuaries outside the city walls provided religious folk which were not constrained by the political space within the town. These cult sites provided the space in which a member of the community could be social without being political. They are locations where aspects of religious practices other than the civic ones of Polish religion can be approached. So Ares provides a case where we can study religious practices of social groups outside of the dominant, dominant sphere of Polish religion. Since none of the votives found at RS carry a dedicatory inscription, the identity of their donors is not known. Having said that, votive gifts, like other artifacts, carry the potential to reveal aspects of the identity of the votaries, such as gender and status. 
The idea that the consumption and display of objects directly reflects identities has been rightly critiqued. Yet, it should be clear that established gender associations of artifacts can be used as interpretive tools for investigating social practices, especially when not simply reproducing modern prejudices about the significance of individual artifacts and their links with different categories of people, so that weapons, for example, have exclusively male associations and that uh, ornaments are strictly associated with women, but considering their complete archaeological uh, context, possible identity-related objects can be revealed. Even if associating material culture with social groups is a frequent issue, the subject matter of terracotta figurines from RS already points to certain groups. Images of human individuals, as we have seen, consisted for the most part of busts of girls and women, and also some young males. Other frequent types were female uh, musicians, girl and boy students, and some riders on horseback. As mentioned before, they can probably be identified as representations of the worshippers themselves or of the people for whom uh, they were asking protection. As far as deities are concerned, we saw how Aphrodite clearly stands out. She was the standard for female beauty and patron of the sphere of sexuality, and her cult was emphatically the preserve of women. Nearly all other represented divinities are equally concerned with femininity or the vitality of children and the future of the family. In addition to the overriding female character of the figurines, other, characters, other categories of votive offerings include objects typically associated with them. For example, the tools used in spinning and weaving, essential skills of housewives and brides-to-be, were also dedicated. Loom weights, spindles, Spindle wheels and die staffs were all present among the votives. The die staff was a tool usually associated with the status of women as matron or lady of the house, while the dedication of spindles and whirls was considered appropriate for certain goddesses. When combined with other fine categories such as miniature mirrors, work on hairpins, ceramic and glass perfume bottles, and pieces of jewellery, all of which are traditionally identified, identified as archetypical female attributes, as also depicted on funerary stele, of which we see an example here, the assemblage yields a consistent picture of womanhood as the dominant theme of the sanctuary, at least for the Roman imperial period, and of women as the social group most, most probably responsible for their dedication. The votive material presented uh, before suggests that the rituals at Ares were performed principally, if not exclusively, by women. Women's ritual activities and educations were always related to the family. They worshipped in the context of the family, for the sake of the family, or with the goal of reproducing the family. Since the mortality rate during childbirth of both mothers and children in antiquity was quite high and successful reproduction was believed to depend on the will of the gods, representative anxiety was a common topic in female religious practice. Women were normally located at home and female interests were closely tied to the house and household. But the cult site of Ares is located outside of the sphere of normal domestic life and even outside the urban center on the very margin of urban civilized life. This marginal location is not only related to the social political status of women, but also to the nature of the cult that they practice there. Women enjoyed a particular, a peculiar ambivalent uh, status in civic society. They were neither outsiders to the political community, nor were they full participants. They enjoyed the protections of the state. They shared only imperfectly in its management for matters of uh, politics as well as religion. In the ancient ritual system, males and females could not always share the same ritual space. Ritual restrictions for females were often based on situations associated with reproduction. Women, identified with their bodies and subject to physical conditions beyond their control, such as the loss of bodily fluid through lactation and menstruation, were considered a source of pollution. They could therefore be excluded from certain male rituals or denied access to sacred space and communal sacrifice. Conversely, some rituals, especially those related to the female condition and uh, woman, woman's represent, reproductive function, could not be attended by men, and such rites were generally organized by women themselves without any male supervision. Rituals pertaining to issues of human fertility and life crisis of women 
as part of wild nature, or therefore often relegated to the wild nature outside the town. The fact that the very action of suckling an infant, for example, was represented by terracotta figurines at Ares already suggests that the reproductive function was one of the issues ritually addressed there. Rituals dealing with questions of female fertility could apparently not be accommodated within the sacred boundaries of Sergalassos and then therefore consigned to the marginality of the urban periphery where they were housed in the cave-like rock crevices of Ares. Caves are known to have played a considerable role in cults concerned with fertility, also in Pisidia as indicated by several sanctuaries of the mother goddess. They were a type of natural formation with features that can be perceived as betwixt and between, in the sense that they were neither inside nor outside of the mountain, neither above nor below ground. Furthermore, caves lend themselves to metaphoric association with the female body. They were therefore natural settings for ritual activities related to life cycle uh, rituals. Settings for such rites of transition between birth and death often draw on natural features that can be perceived as being betwixt and between, contrasting cultural categorizations of the environment, a contrast that can be perceived as analogous to the social betwixt and between of transition rites. The liminal dimensions of social life may thus lead to conceptualization of specific kinds of natural places as liminal. Given her prominence at RS, at least during the Roman imperial period, it was probably Aphrodite that was in charge of the stages of the female life cycle, as she is known to have presided over the sexual maturation of women. At such moments of transition, like childbirth and before marriage, women came out of, uh, women came out of the change that they or a uh, family member were approaching. Such uh, small scale, possibly family based ritual events are also brought out by the evidence of the meals held at RS, as mentioned before. To conclude, this paper has tried to elucidate the character of the so called rock sanctuary, a cult site in the periphery of Sagalassus, as a nexus of nature and society. The absence of monumental architecture, sculpture, or writing identify RS as a natural sanctuary, a non monumentalized cult site with a natural feature in cause of a cave-like crevice as the primary recipient of worship. It was an enculturated natural feature which became a religious monument through a process of constructive social and ritual practice rather than through its physical creation by human agents. Although the site stayed in use for more than four centuries, throughout this period it remained very modest from an architectural point of view, even during the Roman imperial period when several other cave sanctuaries in the region were enlarged and monumentalized. This fact, together with its extra moral location, suggests that RS was located outside the sphere of official Polish religion as a focus of popular religious practice. In spite of its modest architectural settings, RS yielded an abundance of votive offerings dedicated over a considerable period of time, which identifies it as an important cult site for certain groups within the community of Sagalassos. Besides the consumption of ritual meals, the deposition of votive offerings provided to be proved to be a key religious activity taking place there. The remains of these rituals have been used here to describe the social groups involved. While lack of written sources at RS will never allow us to obtain complete certainty concerning the composition of the participating groups, representative votive offerings in the form of terracotta figurines leave no doubt that female concerns stood at the heart of the cult practice there. Issues of love, sexuality, motherhood, childhood, education and health were all clearly brought to bear at the sanctuary. The presence of other categories of gender material culture provides corroborating evidence to that extent. Consequently, it is permissible to assume that these gifts were primarily, if not exclusively, dedicated by women, reflecting their social roles as wives and mothers. The untouched natural space of this popular cult site already sets it formally apart from the urban center with its monumental sanctuaries. Yet also its isolated location on the margins of Sarglasas places it outside of the official sacred landscape. RS owed this marginal position not solely to the natural formation at its core, the cave-like crevice, but also to the rituals that were performed there. Because the latter involved propriety towards the gods that chiefly addressed the fertility issues of the female part of, lo of the local community and may even have been related to the stages of the female life cycle, these rituals could apparently not be accommodated within the sacred boundaries of the urban center, 
as the ritual system of the polis that fight the female reproductive processes as polluted. The marginality of RS thus makes a clear case in which nature and cult can be related to societal circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention. Evet, Peter Terloen'e çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Süleyman Demirel Üniversitesi öğretim görevlisi Peter Terloen, e, Sagalasos Kaya Tapınağı'nda yürüttüğü araştırmaları bizlerle paylaştı. Gerçekten muazzam e, bilgilerdi. Karşılaştırmalı örneklerle beraber e, Kaya Tapınağı'nı, Antik Dönem Kaya Tapınağı'nı ve içerisinden e, çıkarılan figürünleri gördük. E, bir de duyuru yapalım e, konferansımızın sonunda. Bir zamanlar Toroslar'da Sagalasos sergisi Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanat'ta 23 Ağustos'a kadar devam ediyor. E, sergimizi istediğiniz zaman haftanın 7 günü açık. İstediğiniz zaman e, fiziki olarak gelip ziyaret edebiliyorsunuz. Çeşitli e, tabii pandemi nedeniyle e, güvenlik önlemlerini alarak. Aynı zamanda e, bir zamanlar Toroslar'da Sagalasos sergisini 3D online sanal e, sergi turu olarak da erişime açtık. Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanat Yayıncılık web sitesi üzerinden sergiyi de e, sanal tur olarak gezebiliyorsunuz. Aynı zamanda sosyal medya hesaplarımızı da takip ederek e, Sagala Sos sergisine dair yaptığımız e, paylaşımları da görebiliyorsunuz. E, bizim e, Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanat olarak düzenlediğimiz arkeoloji konferanslarımız devam edecek. E, bir sonraki konferansımızda görüşmek üzere. Hoşçakalınız, sağlıkla kalınız.